Good, good. Okay. Um, oops. Okay, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us. Um, thank you for being so good to you, to us, Lord. We love you and help us now to look into your word and to understand it. In your name, Jesus Christ, we pray. For beside you, there is no other God. Amen. Okay, what I, before I get into the lesson, I want to show you a chart that I made. This is, uh, right, this is, uh, uh, okay, this is uh, Illustrator. This is a drawing program, but it's really neat for doing any, anything. Um, what I, the neat thing about the Bible, it's got, like I said, patterns, and we're, we're going to encounter them as we go through it. We're going to encounter it, but I just wanted to get you a, a, a heads up. How you read the Bible is it, he gets you into a rhythm, and then God changes something. And when he changes something, it's like he's calling attention to it. And here we have, like, for example, I'll just give you one. There's so many of them. Seth. The uh, Bible says that when Adam was 130, Seth was born. Seth is the third son. I mean, he, might, they might, he probably had other boys, but this is the one that, these are the ones that are mentioned. Abel, Cain, and Seth, or Cain, uh, Cain, Abel, and Seth. But then the next time you read about three boys, it's Noah, Sam, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, three boys, and something changes. I mean, something happens Something changes at, at, at Seth, you'll find out that from there on, people, as mentioned, that so-and-so lived so many years and they die. It's like they're mortal. Uh, and then at Noah, we know things changed because that's when the flood came, so there was a big change. And in the, in the lives of people, you can see how they start to, they were living up to 800, 900 years, and up then at Noah, the life expectancy shortens. And then the next time you, you run across a man with three boys, it's Terah. And that's Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And something changes again. So see, and so once you see those, once you see some of these patterns, that's the joy I read in the Bible because you know God is about to do something different. He's changing something. Um, and we're going to see some of those changes in today's lesson. Um, So we're going to try to cover Genesis 2.4 to 2.25. That's 21 verses. Hopefully we can go through them really quickly, and then we can break out. We can't have coffee yet because we don't have it here, but we would. And pan de dulce. Okay, the word of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. That's what the Bible says. Okay, Genesis was, is written by Moses, so we don't even spend time there guessing who wrote it because we got better things to do. The book of beginnings. Okay, and, and we dealt with, this is where we stopped last time. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that is, because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created and made. Look at this. And remember, to me, that's a key. Anytime I'm reading the Bible and all of a sudden he starts uh, repeating a word or repeating a phrase or something, I want to pay attention. What is God saying here? Because he's saying something. I mean, he's always saying something. Every little thing means something. But to me, it's like uh, that's, that's one of the keys, you know? Okay, so here we have, look at this. Look how many times he says, ended his work from all his work, from all his work. Again, that's repeating. It's like God's saying, are you hearing me? And so the Bible, and look at this again. He made, he made, 
God created and made. Again, we have three repetitions right after the other one. Ta, 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 ta. And, and the Hebrew the writings, they do, uh, especially when you read uh, uh, Proverbs, he re they repeat a thing again. You know, it's repeated. It's said again so in a different form, but it's repeated. And that's one of the forms you find in Proverbs or the Hebrew writing. But what this is saying, and, and some people are afraid of the Bible because it will condemn you. Because it's, it's, they think that they ought to be living in a high standard, and so they're not going to read the Bible because the Bible will condemn them. But actually, what the Bible is saying, and the Bible says he rested, and the Bible is saying it's, it's all his work. He's already done it. He's already done all the work. And that's the beauty. When you read the Bible from that point, you can never live like Moses. I mean, Moses, I mean, he was held in high regard because he, he did a lot of work for God. And, or you could never live like Joseph. Wow, to be like Joseph, good night. Or to be like Daniel or Samuel. I mean, these people, I mean, wherever they walked, it was like the golden street. They, per, they, they, they pleased God. Um, but you can never live like that. I mean, if you, live, if you read the Bible and think that you're expected to live like that, the Bible will flatten you out. It'll be too heavy for you. And you says, I can't read this thing because nobody can live like that. Well, guess what? You can't. That's why Jesus lived for us like that. He lived it all. It's his work. He did it all. And that's what this is saying here. I just wanted to stay, uh, camp a little bit on this. because. And now look at that. God. 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 It's repeated again. You look at that word. It means Elohim. El. Elohim. Um, and I, I, uh, 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 Miss Amanda's little boys were walking by here a little while ago, Mark's little boys, and their names are Gabriel, Gabriel, and Michael, L, you know, and they got the names of God in those boys' names. Um, I thought, that is, I just caught it. Michael and Gabriel walking around here, whoa. They said, we didn't plan it like that. It's amazing that they didn't. Um, Anyway, Elohim, that means the almighty, powerful God. That's what that means, okay? Now, we saw this, how every day, the six days he created, we saw where God says it was good, except on the second day. I mean, that's missing. That ought to tell you something. What? Did that make, they made, somebody made a mistake or something? They draft, left it out. But no, God did that on purpose. And we saw why we think that that is like that. On the second day when he created space, the second heaven, you know, that is throughout, it's because we know that that's inhabited by evil spirits. That's for Satan, and we'll look at that. Uh, and then finally, we look at this. Uh, on the seventh day, there's nothing mentioned about it being good either or the morning and the evening, which he had been following before. So that's left out as well. Because the seventh day is the day of, it goes on into eternity. That's what that, that, that's what that means. Look at this. Uh, you have the dispensation, uh, dispensations. The first one, and I'll show you why, why I mean eternity. The first, it ended in failure. Okay, the time of innocence, the period of innocence, they failed. I mean, and that was really quick. They had to be taken out. And then same way with the conscience, they failed as well. That God had to destroy the earth. With human government, they failed as well. God had to confound the languages. With uh, the promise, they got themselves into bondage, the people that did it. Under the law, they couldn't keep the law. It, they failed, so Jesus was crucified. Under grace, which we live now in, it's going to be failure as well because people are not believing it. And so Jesus is going to come back to judge the world. And guess what? Under the kingdom, it's going to fail again. Under a perfect environment, and that's why God is going to have to do away with the whole thing and start over. And that's why the, day, the seventh day moves into eternity. or in, It's a, the perfect day. It moves into uh, where there'll never be another day. And that's why I believe that's left out. Okay, 
These are the generations. So we start here. These are the generations of heaven, of the heavens and of the earth, when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heaven and the, the made the earth and the heavens. So it's like God tells you something, and a little later on, He tells you again what He did, but now He's going to add a little more detail. Okay. Um, so, but something interesting happens here. He changes something. Look at this. Yahweh. All of a sudden, that word comes up. We have been told all along, we've been following the word God. The Almighty has been, has been doing all this creation. But then you get to this verse where it says that he made, and the heavens were created, period. They were done. They were finished. And that in the day that the Lord God made the heaven, the heaven and the earth. So we get, and I put that, at, I, use, I like to use a triangle for, uh, for a symbol of heaven and for God. And that's just me. I, I don't know where I picked that up. I must have picked it up from somebody. Um, they, that means they were created. Heaven, the heavens and the earth were created. In that day, so the, here's, here again, he's, he's, uh, Repeating something. They were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth. Look at this. In that day, the self-existing eternal. And I looked at various sources, and they say, performing the promise, finish. Power, and you get both power and perfection. When you get Lord God, you get both. You get the perfection and it, it, and the power, the mighty power combined. All up to this time, we've seen, we've been looking at the power. And look what it says in, in Exodus 6, 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. So God chooses when to step. And he, now Moses wrote this book. So Moses is telling us in hindsight. These three guys, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were, they were, God made promises to them, but they didn't see them come to fruition. And look what Hebrews 11, 13 tells us. These all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So, you know, we think that these people didn't live like by faith. Everybody has always lived by faith. Everybody. Abraham lived by faith. Isaac lived by faith. Jacob lived by faith. And we live by faith. That's the way of God. That's the way he's always done things. They didn't have the Bible back then, but uh, they were given, they saw the power of God. And let's look at that. Uh, these are the generations of the heavens. You know what? I think I was in the wrong place. These are the generations of heavens and of the of earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God created them. So here we get the, the change. This is where God adds the Lord God. His name is now added. And, and if you read from here on, you'll see that name come up. And so it tells us about these guys that live by faith, and that's, that's us. So they were created. And here's the thing that's going around in science. Science is saying that they're now changing their tune. They're saying that this earth was eter is eternal, that the matter is eternal. I've heard that said by several, and the, God tells us that it's not. He created them. He is the eternal one, but the heavens and the earth, they're not eternal. They're created. They're matter. So people that go around saying that this is the, the space, the material has always been here, contradict the word of God. 
because God says they were created. So now we have a movement towards order. So God is changing. It's, he's starting. He's made a change because up to now we've been looking at God as the Almighty. And every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the earth ground. This is before it grew, before the plant, before it was on the earth, before it grew. But we've heard before that on the third day, God grew the vegetation. But now he's given us more detail. You know, we saw that on the third day. He says he made it the oceans, the earth, and the vegetation. But here we're told before it grew, look what God is doing. Now God is getting, we're getting more detail as to how involved God is. The Lord God. Now, how can, and this is difficult. I think, to me, one of the first things is that when I became a Christian, one of the first things I had, my mind had to grasp was how does, how does God work in time? You know, how does he do this? Well, he doesn't have time. God doesn't have, if you, if you try to put, if you, got, if you try to give God time, you're going to get messed up because God doesn't have time. He lives in the past, present, and the future. And I can't grasp that. My mind cannot go there. I just, uh, I can't. Because I can't understand that heavy. It's, but, because I live in time. And everything is about time for me. And so, the Lord God is eternal. And so he says, in order for, the way I understand it is this. One author says, it's like a man that's writing a, a, a novel and he has a character hanging on a cliff, you know, on his story. And then uh, a friend comes by and says, hey, let's go get some coffee. And he says, yeah, sure, let's go get some coffee. He, he takes off, and he leaves the man hanging on the cliff. And he never comes back to finish the novel. The man stayed hanging on the cliff, and he's going to be hanging there until the man comes back and finishes the novel because they're different times. And for me, that's how my mind grasps. That's, that's how, God, uh, I, how I see time, okay? Now, there was not a man to till the ground. And here we have infinite. How can, how can the finite, that's us, understand the infinite? And God does it. You can see how God is working. He wants to bring somebody, he wants to bring a creature right into his world. Can you imagine? I always think of this. You know, when I was in high school, I was always very bashful, you know. Um, to ask a girl to, to dance with me, good night. It took a whole lot of courage, you know, to walk across the room, and you, see, you think that everybody's watching you. Nobody cares. But you think they are. They're watching you, and, you're gonna, and you hope she says no. I mean, she says yes, you know. And then the next thing is not to step on her. But uh, it's such a, and God wants to do that with us. You know, he wants to do that with us. Uh, he wants, he, he wants to get us into his circle of being. Um, that's how he does it, because we'll see the detail here. Okay, now watch this. This is, this is power. This is mighty power. Uh, this is Katrina in 2005. Um, in God, we see his power. Uh, look at this. This is a, a, a complex, folks. This is amazing to me. I, I was looking for, I couldn't find the actual, what it looked like before it was tore down. Katrina did this. Look at how it flattened this home, uh, uh, this uh, uh, structure. Uh, there's a car in the pool. There it is, you know. Uh, look what it did to this boat. Drag it out, right out of the gulf into a road. What kind of power, what does it take to do that? Look at this. God, every once in a while, God gives us demonstrations of how powerful he is. And, I mean, we've seen it with volcanoes and tsunamis uh, recently with another tsunami. In the, in, uh, 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 we saw that kind of power. Uh, what about this? You know, in, in, in nature, we see a lot of uh, cruelty. People say, well, if, if I go out, I can go out to, the, to hunt, hunt or fishing, and I can worship God there. Because uh, I can be, meet with God. No, you can't. Because, well, you can see his works. You can see, like, 
the cruelty in nature. This is a, a water bug sucking the brains out of a frog. It ain't so pretty, folks. You will not find love there. That's not what it's about. And, and Psalm 19 tells us that. Psalm 19 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Glory, splendor, weight, and handiwork, power. That's what you see in nature. You can see his, his power. But look at this. The, the other part of that psalm, Psalm 19, says the law of the Lord is perfect. See how it changes his name? Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, in, enlightening the eyes. So there's quite a change there. But you will not find that in nature. You will not, in fact, you will never find the love of God in nature. You'll find it in his word. It's only found in the Bible. If somebody says God is love, you can always ask them, how do you know that? They can't say because nature tells me or the stars tell me that. No, they don't. You'll only find that in the word of God. And that's, uh, that's the Lord Jehovah. So here we are. God is trying to. He's going to do a special creation now. We're getting to man, and this is why he wants to bring, bring him a little closer. Look what he does. It says, but there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. We've been dealing with waters before. Remember the waters that were gathered together, and the, uh, out of the waters came the creatures? It's out of the waters, but now there's a fine mist. I can't help but think, I says, how did God do this? You know, there's a, this is water as well. A tiny, a cloud of tiny water droplets suspended in the atmosphere. That's water, the atmosphere. Out of the water, waters that came from the waters. Or at near the earth's surface. Look what he's doing. God takes, and it says this, and the Lord God form man out of the dust, out of the ground. So I thought, how did he get the dust going? And he must have, did he blow it? And he gets all these particles? Because, you know, I have, I'm an artist, of course, right? So I've gone before, when I was a kid, and we moved around and stuff, I would, whenever I would find a, a water, a body of water or something, like a creek or, a, or something, you can go down there and look for a clay. And sometimes I would fly, find clay, good clay, clay that you can take and mold, and then you can just set it in the sun, and it'll harden into whatever you want it. But you would have, you go into the clay, you gotta uh, uh, make sure that you take the rocks and sticks and, and any any impurities out of it, because you want fine clay. And I was thinking that's what God did here; He formed man out of the dust. And look what He does. This this word "form" is also what a potter does forming this thing. Fine work, you know. This is what the Lord is doing. He's forming something out of the ground, out of the, out of the dust. And look what he does. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. This is a lot different than what he did with the other creations. I mean, he's taking a lot of effort. He breathed into his nostrils. Look at that. This is the eternal God. And that word, uh, um, into, entrance or a passing from the outside of a thing into its inner parts. That's amazing. He breathed into his nostrils, this clay of thing he's made, the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Right here and then you have man. And throughout the Bible, you'll find this is the beginning, and you'll find that man has three parts, and it's very important. You'll see it in the tabernacle. We'll see that in the tabernacle, how it's there. You have the body, you have the soul, and you have the spirit. Man is complete that way. He is formed this way. God goes into all this work to put man together like this. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Look how 
Again, look at the name, Lord God. It's not God. It's not pure power. We were told before that on the third day, God created all the plants, all the vegetations. But here we are getting more detail. He planted a garden. You know? I, I, there was a man, uh, a neighbor we had. He was an old guy. And he lived in his garden. Oh, he grew the best tomatoes. Oh, the best carrots. And it was like he was just like dirt, you know. He was playing with dirt, but, oh, he grew good stuff. He had corn in that garden. Um, and I remember as a kid going over there and just watching him, and he said, move that thing over here or move that board or bring that board over here, and I'd hang around with him. But uh, he planted, he had a garden, a really nice garden. And uh, look, look at all the work that God is doing. Planted a garden. He made provision for this creature he made. I mean, he really provided for him. Can you imagine the kind of fruit that must have been there or vegetables in that garden? And then he says, there, he, he put the man whom he had formed. He's, he's taking all kinds of care for this creature. And you see that right at the beginning, God's providing for everything. And you know what? That is still how he does for us. He's still doing that. He's making all these provisions. And out of the garden made the Lord God to go grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. He's, he's providing for them. And the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Right up, I mean, right at the beginning, here you have, notice how little we spent in, in creation. I mean, the stars only took a, a, a little phrase. He made the stars also. That's all, he, that's all we know about the stars. It's like, good night. But here he's going, getting into cons, all kinds of details. It's amazing how he loves us. He loves us. And you can see right at the beginning, and we are a special kind of a creature. Because look at this. At the, right at the start, there's a tree of life in the middle of the garden and a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This says... Free will. I think we're getting now into God saying, I'm going to do something special with this creature. It's almost like you read people and they say, God took a chance. God has taken a chance in giving us free will because he's trusting us. It's not, it would be like, I remember my grandpa one day out on Lubbock, you know, outside of Lubbock, about 35 miles north of Lubbock, you know, where it's flat. There's nothing out there, folks. I mean, it is flat. Uh, sandstorms come up, and that's a big sky. And we were driving out in the country one day in a 53 Ford pickup, and he stopped. And he says, and he got off, and I saw him. He just stopped. He didn't say anything. He just stopped. There was not a soul in the country road for miles. And then he went around the truck, and I'm watching him, and he comes and says, move over. What? Move over. So I move over. So I says, what? I'm going to drive? He says, yep. I says, good night, I'm going to drive. And so, you know, when the, 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 the gas pedal and the starter were on the same place, you know, the, pet, the starter, this is way back, folks. In order to start a truck, you put the key on, and then you press the little knob right there by the gas pedal. And, and, and at the same time, you got to give it gas because it won't start. So you go, Arr! and the other foot is on the clutch, you know. And I was just a little guy, so I had the clutch like this, and I was stepping on both these pedals. And it started, boom. And I'm thinking, good night, I'm driving, oh boy. And the steering wheel was about this big. I mean, it was huge. And it had a lot of play in it, you know? I mean, to keep it steering, I mean, to keep it straight, you have to go like this constantly, you know? These new cars, you just put a finger on it, you know? And it stays straight. Not those cars. You have to do this just to keep it straight. And so we take, and he just sits there. That's all. There's all the conversation. I'm going to drive. He says, yep. And I thought, good. No, I love my grandpa. I mean, he trusted me. My dad never trusted me like that. My grandpa did. And I mean, I'm driving about 35 miles an hour, and we're going like this, you know. And he's just sitting there like nothing. And I look over him, and he says, oh, boy, this is great. He trusted, and not, this is what God is doing here. He, he gave us the free will, the freedom of will. And he knew already we're going to make a bad choice. 
but he did it. You can see it way back then. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Look at this. And the river went out of Eden to the water of the garden, and from thence it was parted, and, and it became four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that, that is, which compass, encompasses the whole land of Havilah, for there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is bedelium, an onyx stone, and the name of the second was Gihon, and the name... And the same is that it encompasses the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hidekel, that is, which goeth towards the east of Assyria. And the fourth name was Euphrates. Folks, I, you know how many, how many hours I spent reading this and studying it? And I don't know what it is. I don't know where it's at. They must have known at one point. They must have known. We know where the Tigris is. We know where the Euphrates is. We know where the Nile is. Uh, we don't know what Pison is. We know that Arafat, Ararat is up there. That's where the mountain where Noah landed. So somewhere around this place, some, some place, somewhere around this triangle, that's where Eden was. But we don't know. But somewhere around there, we get clues. Look at this. This is the land that was given to Abraham. God gave him this land. Look at this. In Genesis 15, 18, in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So we know that that's the land he gave him. So somewhere around there, the Garden of Eden, but then after the flood, things changed. And Moses, probably at the time of writing, probably there was enough people there to understand what he was talking about. But we don't, you know. But look at this. That's the land that Israel now occupies, a little strip. And the world is up in arms thinking, yo, oh, they took that land. Folks, <laughs> what they own is a lot bigger than what they have. What they have is very little. Uh, one day they're going to get it. That's why I'm pro-Israel. You know what? Overnight, when I became a Christian, overnight, within three months, I was pro-Israel. Just reading the Bible, oh, I'm, I'm pro-Israel. I tell people, I wish I was born Jewish. But as long as I'd be a Christian, you know, I wouldn't change that. Uh, but look at this. And the place that they're placed, I mean, that triangle is pointing in three directions, right? Look at this. Europe, Asia, and Africa. Look at the location where they were placed. It's no accident. Israel is in the right place. Israel is in that locale because God put them there. Uh, Look what the Romans 3, 2 says. Much every which way, chiefly because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. And Miss uh, Margaret uh, had emailed me a, a, a link in which bo we both agreed. I said, you know, it's a shame that Israel is acting the way they're acting. They're atheists over there, mostly. But they had the tree of life. Can you imagine that little garden had the tree of life? Everybody in the world would have to go there to get of the tree of life get eternal life. That's what they were there for. And that's where the word of God comes from. The word of God is a Jewish book, and it comes from them, from the Jewish people. They were the ones that were going to give it to the whole world, and they messed up. They messed up big time, because when the master came, they killed him. We killed him, because we're a sample of humanity. If you go to Israel, it's amazing. If you go to Israel, you find all kinds of people there. They look just like us. But they're all talking different. You I mean you can get in an elevator, <clears throat> and there'll be people talking German, people talking Russian, <clears throat> people talking Dutch, people talking Mexican or Spanish, you know? I mean, you find everything there in Israel. You say, wow, it's amazing. You go to Bethlehem, and uh, there's a lot of Spanish people there. Uh eres tú? Yo soy de Texas. ¿Dónde es Texas? Oh, Estados Unidos. No he ido de Texas. You haven't heard of Texas? Good night. But there's people like that. ¿Te gustaría tomar algo? Sí, algo, un vaso de agua. ¿Jugo de naranja? Sí, cómo no. And they went and got me some orange juice. And the guys in the bus says, hey, where'd you get that stuff? I says, I got people here. Huh. <laughs> that was funny. But there's Spanish-speaking people there, lots of them. And that's, of course, that they were kicked out in 1492. They were kicked out of Spain. You know the Moors? 
So, of course, but that's a microcosm. Israel is a microcosm of the whole world. They're a simple of humanity, and that's why they're there. They had the tree, and they messed up. But, you know, nonetheless, we get the word from them, and we still get the tree, the cross. You know, it still comes from there. You know, that's where it was planted, and we still get eternal life through that cross. Okay, we need to speed up. Uh, and the Lord God took man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, to take care of it. Look at this. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat it, eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thou shalt surely die. It's simple. That's what it is. That's what it says. Just like salvation, it's free. There's no strings attached to it. You, can, you don't have to do anything. People get tempted all the time to say, you got to get baptized, you got to go to church, you got to do this, you got to do that. No, you don't. Once you get saved. Moms have heard me say that forever because I've ta taught little kids. And I, I remember once, uh, one time I, I was teaching these kids, and I said, you know, you, once you become a Christian, you can go rob a bank, and, and, and you can get shot, and you go to heaven. And the kids, they, I mean, I had about 15 kids, and they were all happy. Really? I says, yes. That's the kind of guy we have. He won't take it back. And after church, you know, and then we went on with a lesson. And afterwards, I had a mom coming straight at me. I mean, she was steaming. <laughs> Did you tell my boy he could rub a bank and kill somebody and still go to heaven? I says, uh, yes, ma'am. Why would you do that? I says, because it's the truth. And she was just, how, how, you can't be teaching that. I says, yes, I have to. I says, but did he, did he tell you the other part? He says, what other part? That there's consequences. I says, he can spend the rest of his life locked up like a bird in a cage, you know? I says, did he tell you that? He says, no, he didn't. Well, I told him that, too. Um, but that's, salvation is free. It is free. There's no strings attached to it. And there you find it. Uh, thou, he says, don't, don't eat of it. It's plain. Look, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There it is. He says, you have the freedom. He gave us the free will, but there it is. There's consequences. And so I think we're going to have to stop. Well, let's, let's go cover a little bit more. <clears throat> and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. Notice how, how he made him with all the, all the care he took to make man. Before he put him, provide all the garden for him and all. And now he says, it's not home for him to be alone. He's doing all, he's taking care for all this. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And what to Adam called them, called every creature, that was the name thereof. So he gives, you know what this is? And we know, we think in the background, this is what's going on, folks. Okay, Adam is now in charge. He's in charge. Whatever he would call them, you know, that's authority. And you know how, um, look at this. This is a concept of the kingdoms. Uh, the kingdom of God, there's no dark there. It's all light. Uh, and we know that when, uh, this is the face of the deep. We looked at it at the, at the first lesson. And then we saw how Satan fell. And when he fell, he took a third of the angels with him. Okay. So this, is, this encompasses the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God encompasses everything. But then the kingdom of heaven only encompasses the earth and the atmosphere around the earth. That's the kingdom of heaven. That's where we live. But we know that Satan, who is the prince of the power of the air, he ha has uh, access to both um, space and into our earth. We know that through the book of Job, we find that out, that Satan can come into this realm of ours, and he can do damage. We, the Bible tells us we ought not to be ignorant of his devices, how he works. He has access. We find that through the book of Job. Now, look at this. We'll, we'll close here. And Adam gave names of all cattle to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. Again, he's got authority. Because we see that act of authority, we see it in Daniel 1.1, 1, 1, 1, 7, it says, Unto whom the princes of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, 
and to Hanani, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and unto Azariah, Ab Abnigal. See, the prince of the eunuchs had power to do that. He had authority. And we see another example where the Lord says in one, Psalm 147.4, He telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by names. That says he's, got so he's sovereign. He's got authority to do that. So we know that when that naming take, took place, that Adam was naming the creatures, he's got authority. But guess who's watching? I think Lucifer is watching this. And remember, he was given so much power, so much. Uh, 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 he had authority because we know he had a throne. We know that. But he sees this little creature, this little worm, this little nothing that God has made out of dirt. And God has given him all this kind of authority. And you know what? It's going to set him up. And he's going to come down and take the crown from Adam. And we're going to have to stop it there. Okay? But it all comes together so well. Okay? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us. Thank you for this day and help us now to worship the rest of the day um, in spirit and in truth. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor through your son's name.